Hello and welcome to the ninth instalment of Guido Talks. Yes, nine episodes already. Don't forget, if you'd rather just hear us and not look at our lovely faces, you can, of course, find Guido Talks as a podcast wherever you normally get your podcasts or find out how on the Guido Talks website. I'm Tom Harwood and I'm joined again this week by Paul Staines, the founder and editor of Guido Forks and reporter Christian Calgi. You're listening to or watching Guido Talks, the weekly roundup of our favourite stories from the Guido Forks website. So let's kick off this week with what was undoubtedly our most read, most clicked on, but perhaps not most shared story of the week. Uh, And it's something to do with Piers Morgan. So Paul, can you tell us a bit more about what's going on here? Well, Piers Morgan is now the prince of the woe karate. And it turned out that one of our readers had a photograph from some years back of Piers Morgan in Nazi uniform. Now, you might say, you know, 30 years ago, people did wear uh, fancy dress outfits and the comedy Nazis. But Piers Morgan is the person who, when Justin Trudeau was exposed for uh, having done blackface when he was a student, said that he had to resign. Piers Morgan is the one going on about the symbolism of the statues. So it seems to me that it was of interest and of public interest that Piers Morgan's uh, Nazi uniform shame, because it is a shame, because we've got to remember the Waffen SS were found to be guilty of uh, crimes against humanity and a criminal organization. So wearing their outfits is more than just a bit of comedy. Now, um, we ran the story, and I hinted at it in last week's podcast, we ran the story on Saturday. And uh, um, I got some calls about the photo from America from some of the news channels. And we mentioned it to a few of the newspapers and not one single newspaper wants to follow it up. And the irony of that is, of course, that if Piers Morgan so much as farts on Good Morning Britain, it's recovered every single British tabloid. He has been going on about woke issues now for months. If you remember in 2016, he was pro-Trump and anti-woke. And since Black Lives Matter has become more popular, he is now pro-woke. So I think the fact that the hypocrite is wearing, is pictured wearing Nazi uniforms is of interest. No paper has picked it up so far. Today, the campaign against anti-Semitism has said, it's not a matter of fun. It's not a party piece. We should, they, he should explain himself and make amends. And by which I assume, that he should come out and say sorry, uh, which is the least he could do. And if you look back at what he's asked other people to do in similar situations, it's only right that he does the same. It, it does seem odd that when pictures came out of, for example, Paul, Paul Hollywood wearing um, a Nazi uniform, I think, that was covered all over the place. And I'd venture to say that Piers Morgan is a more well-known figure than Paul Hollywood. So the, the silence from a lot of the media does seem a little bit fishy. Well, he's one of their own. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, when we had um, John Witherow coming out of Rachel Johnson's uh, house in London during the, uh, during the lockdown, when I mean, it was the tightest, not one single newspaper covered that answer either. I mean, he's the answer of the Times. So they look after themselves. I, I, I tell a lie. Popvich covered it. So us and Popvich are the only publications that have mentioned that John Rivero, the end of the times, broke the lockdown. It's, it's no wonder people are losing trust in the media. That's certainly, that's certainly true. And, and, and there's more themes with regard to people losing trust in the media this week. Uh, when it emerged that the BBC had... Uh, hired a man by the name of Richard Sambrook to try and make the organisation seem more impartial. He's been hired as an impartiality advisor, particularly with regards to impartiality on social media and on Twitter. 
the ironic thing here is that his Twitter account is about the least impartial thing that you could possibly see. I mean, it, it, was, not, it was not hard to go through this account and find example after example of incredibly critical tweets about Boris Johnson, almost slanderous things saying about Brexit, describing himself as an ultra Remainer, all of this sort of stuff, the, the worst excesses of what people imagine goes on in the BBC newsroom. And this guy was hired to be an hard. impartiality advisor. You, you say it's not hard to see. It is actually very hard to see now because he's, since our story, he's blocked everyone and he's uh, locked his account. You can't see his tweets. Ridiculous situation for uh, the BBC's impartiality star to be hiding his own tweets from us so that we can point out he's not impartial. It is the true BBC approach to... It's the true BBC approach to dealing with uh, bias is just uh, not let anyone see it, but allow it to carry on. <laughs> it's a sort of uh, digital ostrich, uh, just covered up, no one knows. Talking of other digital ostriches, the uh, Sky News head of uh, the newsroom, John Riley, sent out a very strongly worded advisory. In fact, it's, it's not advice, it's not guidance, it's to be adhered to, and he made that very clear, saying that mm. Sky presenters should stop tweeting their opinions and only tweet uh, news stories and a tweet as a product of news gathering. Um, Adam Bolton said this is a very uh, fair, and wise guidance, and then he proceeded to break it day after day. <laughs> well, Adam Bolton seemed to have uh, to to break it by voicing an opinion that it was merely advisory and not uh, completely <laughs> to be adhered to by everyone. Uh, so we'll have to see for how long his uh, his line of tweets continue in there in the way they have been. It's, I mean, it's, with Adam Bolton, it's not just his tweets, it's what he says on the show. I think it was Ian Dale who picked it up um, with, with him uh, this week. And then, and then afterwards, they got into a spat. And uh, it seems that Adam Bolton is just going after about every single Conservative commentator that exists in the country. He's slagged off um, Mark Wallace. He's slagged off Ian Dale. And of course, he absolutely loads me. So, I mean, it does seem like there's a... Um, there's a bit of a, a problem there, and I, I don't know how much uh, this guidance is actually going to help with it. I really enjoyed him admonishing Ian Dale. He was very mild mannered for breach of etiquette in uh, uh, criticising another journalist. This is a guy who criticises journalists he disagrees with every day. It's, uh, Adam, I am very disappointed in you. Very, very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, and there was gosh, of course well, uh, uh, yes well, there, was, there was another uh, issue this week of media hypocrisy almost uh, on a par with Piers Morgan and it was coming day after day from The Guardian uh, who of course were the repository of left wing opinion pieces in favour of of uh, the most extreme elements of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, I saw one yesterday which was saying that in order to move forward, Britain has to acknowledge its past. And I would suggest that the Guardian should learn those lessons themselves because as we revealed earlier in the week, the Guardian's history when it comes to uh, slavery and when it comes to uh, the right of uh, black people, especially black Americans, is not particularly gleaming. Uh, the founder uh, was John Edward Taylor, who made his money in the cotton trade, which of course at the time in the early 1800s was heavily reliant on the American slave trade. It unequivocally supported uh, the, uh, the South, the Confederacy and the Civil War. It was completely opposed to Abraham Lincoln uh, saying it was an evil day for America and the world when he was chosen as president. And they described the proclamation of emancipation of slaves as abhorrent. Um, 
Uh, and uh, this was leapt on. It was one of our most read. The Sun picked it up, the Mail picked it up. And there is now a, uh, a petition, uh, which I believe has passed about 20,000 signatures now. Uh, and we yesterday called on uh, The Guardian to follow uh, some of the other major corporations like Lloyd's of London and Green King and pay up. You know, they have a, a, a billion in reserves. Uh, there's no reason that they shouldn't be paying reparations for their dark history, especially when every day they're having a go at everyone else uh, for uh, pro-slavery or, or offensive or problematic views. I mean, this is an example. billion in reserves. In a billion in reserves, the Guardian has furloughed hundreds of of staff, they've got a billion in reserves. Why are they fleecing the taxpayer millions every month when they can afford to pay out their own pocket? We haven't furloughed anyone. We haven't got a billion in reserves. The uh, Spectator and the Telegraph and quite a lot of organisations, now they see that actually we're not going to be, uh, hopefully, the pandemic lockdown isn't going to be as bad as we thought and it's not going to be for months and months and months and it's basically over. Uh, why aren't they still claiming millions in subsidy of the taxpayer? I think I think uh, the Guardian can put into its own reserves to pay its own bills. Absolutely, especially Besides when you look at the when you look at the examples of companies like the Spectator, like the Telegraph, like IKEA that had furloughed people and now are actually paying money back to the Treasury that they took initially. That's an incredibly moral thing to do. And that's, those are companies that weren't sure if they'd have the money to pay for that stuff. Now that they know they have the money, they're paying it back. The Guardian has always had this money and yet they're taking money away from taxpayers of this country. And, and we learnt just on Friday that debt as a proportion of GDP of this country has now passed 100% percent the debt of this economy is bigger than the economy itself and it's thanks to the selfishness of companies like the guardian that that has uh, grown as quickly as it has do you know i'm beginning to wonder if owen jones really does care about the nhs <laughs> well he could uh, he could donate his own uh, his own salary i mean this is the thing for, with with people who earn a lot of money in this country and who campaign for higher taxes. There's nothing stopping anyone in this country writing a check to HMRC if they want to. Anyone who says, oh, I'm taxed far too little in this country, they're very welcome to write out a check and send it to the treasury. In fact, it's, it's sort of odd that they don't, particularly for very well remunerated people like Owen Jones, who has been steadfastly the whole of his life campaigning for higher taxes. He's very welcome to give this government more money so that they can misspend it if he wants to. Or, or at least stop taking tax subsidies off the rest of us. Please, right. Guardian journalist, can you just, you know, use your own money, not ours. Right. Well, that was a, a tranche of media hypocrisy that we've just uh, rattled through. But of course, some things actually went on in Parliament this week as well. And a deeply hypocritical moment came on Monday evening, which was that when uh, members of Parliament approved uh, the executive decision that was already law, but the way that coronavirus legislation works is almost um, the, the Commons has sort of veto power over this stuff after it's been implemented. So uh, members of parliament had the opportunity to debate and then um, approve or not uh, the coronavirus measures, which, which include, of course, the ban on gatherings of more than six people. Now, not a single MP opposed this legislation. They nodded it through without even a vote. So not even an MP like Barry Gardner, who himself attended a gathering of more than six people, or someone who professes to stand up for uh, civil liberties uh, like Caroline Lucas, not, none of them stood up and said, or indeed uh, forced the issue to a vote. So they, they nodded through, the legislation that means that people can be fined if they attend a gathering of more than six people. And yet some of those same people attended gatherings of more than six people. I mean, the hypocrisy is bizarre and it is deeply, deeply curious to see that they have backed both large protests in recent history 
and legislation that makes those same protests illegal. I wonder now if those same MPs will be making amends for what they said, or indeed pressuring the police to prosecute those who attend mass gatherings. I mean, it's, it's not so much the issue of, of whether this legislation is right or wrong, or whether the protests are right or wrong. It's the issue of consistency. If you are going to vote to make something illegal, you should not then say that people can go and do it without uh, any repercussions. That, that just undermines just, uh, just about the most fundamental thing about the rule of law in this country. Rules should be predictable, enforceable, uh, and consistent. And this, this made a mockery of the whole legislating process on Monday evening. It was extraordinary to watch. Thankfully, there is a, there is a sunset clause within the legislation so the ban on gatherings of six or more isn't the uh, most uh, worrying thing for civil liberty campaigners at the moment but I do think beyond the hypocrisy we've got to keep a very keen eye on the R rate following the Black Lives Matter protests because they are in a sense a very good test if there isn't a spike afterwards then actually the government could afford to be more liberal in coming out of lockdown we've got to keep an eye on that but yeah the hypocrisy especially of you know the 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 far labor left the, the uh, zara sultanas of of the of the world uh incredible uh, silence from them on the topic yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm surprised that none of them stood up and said, hang on, can we have an exemption, please, for protests that I agree with? Because that seems to be how they are acting. Um, but no, none of them, none of them did that. Um, but yes, moving on from those protests into another uh, coronavirus related issue. This week, the government scrapped its app and did what we had been calling on them to do for the last three months and go with the Apple Google model. Paul, can you tell us a little bit more about why this is important and what's it about? Well, who could have predicted? Oh, actually, everybody predicted that the government's app, the home-built app that was going to be built by NHSX, doesn't work. And, uh, and right now, it was announced overnight, right now, We've got Matt Hancock and others at NHSX trying to blame Apple for designing a rigorous and secure operating system. If you're going to design an app, you better get it to work with the uh, operating system that you want it to run on. You can't then say, our app doesn't work, why don't you change the whole environment it's in? And uh, we've just had a story today which um, highlights the fact that everyone predicted this, that uh, there was NHSX were doing this partly, and I think more so for glory to prove how clever they were, and partly because Matthew Gould, the CEO of the Quango, is clueless. He's absolutely useless. He has no background in tech, knows nothing about tech, should be fired. The government has failed on IT projects time and time and time again. When Dominic Cummings was a blogger and not in government, he used to rail about this, that the, the hundreds of millions that were wasted in IT projects, often in the NHS, and he said that heads must roll when it goes wrong, we need to be nimble, agile, have uh, better controlled teams, and there must be consequences for failure. Well, this civil servant screwed up. He screwed up on a critical IT issue that has absolutely set back the... Uh, possibility to track and trace and he should pay the penalty for that which is he should be fired not moved aside not made excuses for fired just out the door he should be gone by monday frankly he's useless knows nothing get him out get rid of him he shouldn't be in charge of the next project we need someone who actually maybe has an it background rather than philosophy and divinity <laughs> he hadn't had a prayer you know he hadn't got a prayer Get rid of it. Uh, Goodbye, Matthew. Was, and Dave, you are the weakest link. And it was totally uh, obvious. I, I can't remember why, but I went back and watched uh, either the first Guido talks or the second Guido talks, where all three of us said, this will fail and they will have to adopt 
the Apple Google model, they will have to abandon this absurd centralization that we've seen right the way through this pandemic that has set back public health and government plans every single time. It was obvious it was never going to work because we've seen what happens, especially in countries like America, where the government asked Apple to change their security settings to allow the government into the operating system for whatever reason, whether it's catching criminals or helping with public health crises. And Apple's model is advertised. They run advertisements saying this is one of the most secure operating systems. We will not let governments into your secure data. The gov- uh, they were never going to back down. And still they pressed on with this system. We now look over to Germany where they followed the Apple uh, Google model. The app is running well and track and trace is months ahead of where Britain is, all because this one civil service quango thought he knew better and could push ahead and, and do it his way. It's a big bind for people in the left of this country who want to criticise the government, and yet the government has been following sort of the left-wing ideas throughout the whole of this crisis, whether it's trying to do a centralised testing system, centralising the app, centralizing tracking and tracing and looking across to a company that's more to a country that's more market led like germany that has decentralized healthcare that had decentralized testing that used the decentralized app model and 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 it almost in order to criticize the government you have to take you have to look at things from a pro market perspective and wow what a contrast between the big government big state centralized model that we have been running in this country and the failures that has produced versus the small state decentralized pro-market models that they've used in Germany and how successful those have been. But I, I, think, don't, I, don't, want to go with, I don't want to go overboard with the idea that, the, uh, that this other app is going to be perfect. I'm sure it's going to have problems. I'm sure it's uh, not going to be perfect because I think the idea that you, the phones will keep an eye out and spy on everyone around you and it will all be without fail. We all know phones drop and it's not going to be perfect. But it has a hope of working. The system and the approach that NHSX took under Matthew Gold was destined to fail at all times because it didn't even, it wasn't even compatible with the phone's operating system. So never mind the big picture of the macro uh, problems of the whole theory of these track and trace apps. It wasn't going to work on a micro level because it wouldn't work on the phone and achieve what the software was trying to achieve in any event. Uh, It's not perfect, but I think the other approach is going to be a lot better. Now, of course, we've compared uh, England with Germany just now, but, uh, and and England looks very unfavourable in that comparison. But we can make another. We can compare England with Wales, which has had a terrible time of this pandemic. The Welsh government, of course, labour run. And the, we, we did an article this week that explored the testing uh, failures in Wales, the, the repeated targets that have been missed. They started out saying that they'd be doing sort of, you know, I think it was 8,000 targets um, by the end of one of the earlier months of this year. And they ended that month doing about 1,000 tests. I mean, it was, it was terrible. We did a timeline uh, of each of these failures where it was month one, they'd set target one, they'd fail it, they'd set a lower target, they'd fail that, they set a higher target, they'd fail that again. They had haven't once met their targets. It's a, it's a complete travesty. And I do recommend you look at this article and the timeline that goes through point by point, promise after promise that they failed to deliver. And I think one of the successes in England has been the speed at which testing has been ramped up. And of course, that was delivered by finally embracing the private sector and universities and charities and all that instead of doing this command and control centralised model that Public Health England started out wanting to do. Wales has not been able to replicate that success. And it's a shame because looking at those graphs that the government puts out in every daily briefing, you can see that Wales actually is one of the countries or one of the parts of the United Kingdom that is not seeing the same decline as other parts of the United Kingdom in terms of its cases 
and its deaths. And that's just so very sad that we've had such incompetence from the Welsh government. But this is an article that I do recommend people go out and check because I don't think these inter-country United Kingdom comparisons are made enough. I think when it comes to Westminster media, there's, there's either a binary of looking so surface level that you have reporters praising Nicola Sturgeon for, quite frankly, being at least on par, if not worse, than the Westminster government, or just completely overlooking what's going on in Wales when things don't suit a narrative of constantly criticising Westminster. Wales have, you know, the Welsh government, the Welsh Labour government have been running the NHS there into the ground for at least a decade. So we're probably the least prepared of any of the four uh, nations going into the crisis. And the leadership has just been appalling. As you say, it's been mired by setbacks and gaffes all the way through this. And it's surprising that actually it's not really got any pickup with the mainstream media because uh, these people need to be held accountable. And clearly the local Welsh uh, assembly and the media over there isn't doing a good enough job either. Oh, didn't you hear, Calvi? They said that we're not allowed to call it the Welsh assembly anymore. We're supposed to call it the Welsh parliament. (laughs) Abolish it. Abolish (laughs) it entirely. I think. Waste of time, waste of money. Amazing. Well, okay, moving on from coronavirus, the (laughs) big and consistent story, though, it has been across this entire uh, period. There is actually a leadership election going on now. I mean, not many people may realise this, but the Lib Dems are currently in the process of electing a new leader. And it's getting a little bit mucky, the race that is. Uh, Kaugi, can you tell us what, what on earth's going on with the Lib Dems? Um, Well, that's far too large a question to deal with on this podcast, but specifically on the leadership election. (laughs) Yeah, as as was going to be expected, the the Lib Dems are dirty campaigners. They are ferociously vicious, probably on par with some of the excesses of the SNP. Um, And the the leadership election, unsurprisingly, has uh, delved into insults. We had uh, Vera Hobhouse uh, basically calling uh, Ed Davey a Tory, his heart which beats with the Tories, as she said, uh, which is an odd attack uh, given she was a Tory councillor until 2005 when her and her husband defected. Um, And one of the things we brought to light is that uh, you wouldn't think necessarily that uh, Lib Dem and uh, Lib Dems and and Guido are natural bedfellows but when it comes to them trying to spread their muck as far as possible our inbox has been remarkably uh, full of Lib Dem activists trying to associate Vera Hobhouse with slavery because her husband William Hobhouse is a long descendant of uh, Isaac Hobhouse, who was a uh, Colston contemporary in Bristol. And they're trying to associate her and hypocrisy that she's endorsing Black Lives Matter and she's married into this family with a legacy of colonialism uh, and slavery. We didn't really go near it at the time because, you know, even if anyone cared about the Lib Dems generally, Vera Hobhouse is not going to win. So uh, there's no point getting into the muck there. Um, I guess throughout all this, Leila Moran comes out fairly cleanly. Um, but moving away from the ins and outs, the, the leadership election, I just I can't help wondering whether the, whether the Lib Dems are beyond saving. And if not, what is their role in politics now? They've tried the sort of pragmatic um, coalition building centrism in 2015. They tried single issue europhilia in 2017 and 19. What is their road back to recovery? It's a question not much people about. They're the herpes of Westminster politics. You can never get rid of them. They might die down a little bit, but you'll always still have herpes. And... uh, uh, and, you know, they are, in fact, you know, 
and it's probably a bit. So one of those, some of those emails are fascinating. I, I love the one from the uh, Lib Dem genealogist who not only had traced back the Hobhouse <laughs> family line, had traced back her family line, and she's a Hanoverian and Aristo. I now know far too much about this. I won't bore the readers, but she is a German aristocrat. You wouldn't know. Look at it. She's like German words of gummage to me, but. Um, Sorry, sorry, words of garbage fans, I didn't mean to. Uh, uh, <laughs> the detailed smears they go into. Uh, I mean, they, they are a party, of course, that uh, was the most homophobic campaign of all time against Peter Tatchell back in the 80s, for which I think Simon Hughes, who then suddenly comes out as gay, apologised. But uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Nobody is as a dirty campaigner as a Liberal. I do wonder to what extent the economy is being kept afloat by Lib Dems taking out Ancestry.com subscriptions uh, to <laughs> dig up dirt on their opposition. <laughs> oh, blimey. Well, I think we should probably leave um, one of the more minor parties of the United Kingdom aside for now, especially as they've been polling for quite some time in single figures. Um, and let's, let's just move on um, to something that I think, Paul, you and I have a bit of a disagreement about. And that is the uh, makeover that we're finally getting of the prime ministerial plane. Uh, what are your well, thoughts on that? For once, for once, I think most of our readers and listeners to the podcast will be on your side. I'm not going to back down from this. So I'll, I'll, set, I'll set some of the background. So Cam Force One, as it was originally called, well, actually, Tony Blair was jealous of everybody else having a bigger one than he had. So he... Uh, set the wheels in motion to get an Air Force plane. Now, at the same time, they just got rid of Royal Yacht Britannia, so it looked a bit awkward to spend. These planes cost hundreds of millions. I mean, they are, I think this is an Airbus conversion, isn't it? Mm. And so what they did is they, they got the RAF budget to cover the plane, which was going to be a troop transporter. They then kissed it out like an upmarket private jet. And they spun the papers and the media at the time that this was only going to cost a few million because in the event of an emergency, it would be rapidly converted back to the rather more um, bare metal type troop transport. Absolute rubbish at the time. I knew it was rubbish at the time. I wrote stories. I was writing articles in the Sun about it. It was roused. It's only going to cost a few million. And we said, no, it's going to cost 200 million for the plane or whatever it was. And over the lifetime of this plane, it's going to cost hundreds of millions for what effectively is now going to be a red, white and blue flag, jet-powered flag. Now, I think what you're going to say is that's a good thing. It might be a good thing. But what annoys me most is why didn't Boris just say, look, we're Britain, we're coming back, let's have this plane and God damn, it cost us 200 million, 200 million Soviets. Instead of pretending it's only 900,000 for the paint job, it's not. It's hundreds of millions. Well, I Go think ahead, they Tom. have been. I think they have been pretty upfront that this is this is uh, going to cost money. But comparis- but comparing that money between, for example, the amount that was spent when prime ministers of the United Kingdom used to charter planes from uh, other companies, that was a far greater expense than running a plane themselves. And if we compare this for a second, are we really saying that Britain, the fifth largest economy in the world with enormous global and cultural reach, should be one of the few major countries in the world that does not have a plane for our executive? That is bonkers. Whether you compare it to America is one thing. Compare it instead to the Netherlands or Germany or France, all of which have executive planes. I think it's just ridiculous and stunting our place on the world stage to say, no, we can't have a big union flag that flies from place to place. Tom, let us go word in Christ's sake. Look, under Queen Elizabeth I, the the greatest queen that Britain's ever had, we had a Royal Navy that was effectively privateers. These were, you know, private ships going around, bashing foreigners, you know, invading whatever bits of Spanish empire there were in the private sector. They were privateers. Have you noticed we have an airline called British Airways has big Union Jacks on the fins? And this rubbish you said, oh, it'll cost more, it'll cost more to fly. Rubbish. Look, 
as someone who does occasionally take private jets, I can tell you, they're a lot cheaper than buying business class and first class seats for the whole plane. You know, it's just rubbish. I'm not sure what your argument here is, that Prime Minister should just travel by BA. I mean, that's, that's, that's just ridiculous, and we can't compare the situation um, <laughs> with other countries. I mean, I mean, thinking about the Royal Navy and how it was under Elizabeth I, it was excellent and got lucky a few times, but that's when England was a mid-ranking power in the world. It, was, it only became the dominant power that it was after 1588. Yes, yes, of course. Yes, until 1588, the, the, England, as it was then, was significantly below Spain, was significantly below, it was sort of a little... And how did we get out of it? In the European how did we get out of, we it? out of it? We had a private sector navy. We had a private sector navy. <laughs> You've just given a whole rant about how the NHS can only be saved by the private sector. I pointed out to you that the best of Britain and the best of the growth times were a private sector Navy. And they are saying, Wait, no, that's what a not the, the growth times of Britain were the end of the 1700s, the beginning of the 1800s, when we defeated Napoleon. I mean, really. Admittedly, let's, Paul let's has not a similar back point. <laughs> Admittedly, also Dunkirk was done off the back of private vessels. So that yeah, wasn't exactly. a victory. <laughs> when, that when, was an when, escape. When the state sector got in trouble, who do they call on? A private sector. It's the most <laughs> simplistic analysis that I think I've ever heard. I'm You're sorry, accusing I'm another not. free marketeer of a simplistic analysis. Come on. You know. anyway. I'm sorry. I'm just. Uh, if you said the Netherlands. You, if the Netherlands can have a plane, I want our Prime Minister to have a plane. It's as simple as that. I'll just stick him on EasyJet. And, <laughs> and Elf. Oh, gee, no, not you too. This is ridiculous. You're the most big state guy there is at Guido. Like, <laughs> I don't mind. I, um, I just, if they're going to go down the route of a sort of Austin Powers makeover, I just want it to have a sort of rotating circular bed with a leopard skin. <laughs> leopard skin so does Boris, well. I suspect. So, <laughs> get the lobby <laughs> sitting on that as it revolves over the Atlantic. Maybe yeah, a poll for IT the lobby, lessons. The lo that's the other thing. The lobby. The lobby. The cheek of those buggers. They knew this was going to cost hundreds of millions. But did they like having a GNT with the Prime Minister? They sure did. Maybe not with Theresa May, but it will certainly, I bet it'll be an absolute party flight when they get back from America <laughs> after the FTA is done. Full of people knocking back Budweiser and uh, Jack Daniels. And the lobby loves the idea of getting on, the, uh, getting on that rather than travelling in economy class with the hoi polloi. Um, <laughs> you're all in it together. You're all in it together. Only oh. one of us is standing up for the taxpayer here. Me. Goodbye. Well, on that note, thank you for listening to today's feisty episode of Guido Talks. Uh, we will catch you again next week. Stay alert, stay safe, and goodbye.